this Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> we ought to time to get started. And, uh, oh, is it? Go ahead, yeah, go ahead and get started. Try to get started on time. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to, uh, uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, I know I got it wrote down here. Oh, here we are. Uh, the 22nd verse of chapter 20. Chapter 20, verse 22. Where we're going to start with that. Leviticus. Leviticus. Mm-hmm. You got to remind old folks. <laughs> I slept since last. Well, I've got notes all in my Bible. I, I'll write down the next the date we're supposed to start. Thank you very much. Right. Somebody got to keep, keep up with it. Up with it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's good to see y'all tonight. We got a sparse crowd tonight, but you know it happens when the days get longer and longer, and uh, people get doing more and more things. Uh, but. Uh, Anyway, let me give you some updates. Uh, Kim Hammond's son, BJ, uh, the, uh, they, they did the scan on him and they didn't find cancer anywhere else except where they actually took the, the uh, cyst out of his leg and they found some more there. So they're gonna go in and do another surgery on him. And, uh, but uh, his doctor was unsure, and I don't know what his doctor's name is, but his doctor was unsure of his prognosis, so he uh, he told them if they were okay with it, he wants to send him to MD Anderson. And I told her, I said, there you go, that's a, that's a good thing. And so uh, they're gonna set him up to go to MD Anderson and uh, make sure that they've got his, uh, his diagnosis right and everything. And, uh, and he comes here every now and then, don't he? Blaine? No, Blaine BJ, does. yeah, BJ, yeah, he's, he's been in school. Uh, but yeah, when he's when he's home, he's uh, he comes here with his mama. Is, is it Blake? Uh, Blake. Uh, BJ. You want to play the piano? No, 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 no it's his older brother. No, he okay. works at the factory. Yeah, that's right. He went to work at the mill, didn't he? Mm-hmm. I lose track of people real quick. Anyway, he was he was uh, his, his, him and his dad both work at the mill. Uh, but anyway, he's uh, he, he she said he was in good spirits, and uh, so hopefully they'll. I hope they, they got their uh, diagnosis right. If they do, well, that's a good thing because they said at first that that cancer that he had did not originate, and that's something else that, that when the final lab results came back, it was, it was a different form of cancer than they had diagnosed with the first time. So I think that's another reason the doctor wants him to go to MD Anderson because he knows they'll get it right. And they won't take a chance in uh, messing someone up like they did with Bob. And so uh, that, that's uh, all I know about that. And I also talked to Steve Corley. Uh, so I talked to him Sunday night. And I've, uh, I've texted, uh, uh, communicated with uh, text uh, this week. And uh, he is uh, in real high spirits. He's in Seattle. He's in a two-room department. He's uh, uh, his half-sister that he, he didn't know she's a lot younger than him, has looked him up and found him. Uh, they didn't, they weren't raised up together, and her and her husband has agreed to go out there and stay with him during this ordeal. So that's a, a blessing to all. He's on cloud nine about all that. But anyway, they're, they're still, I don't know, he, he don't know exactly when they're gonna do the lung transplants, but he said that he, he would be down uh, about six weeks uh, where he needed somebody there with him. And so that they're gonna be there with him during that time. Then he'll be in rehab for a long time and they'll keep him out there for about a year, is, is what he's told me uh, earlier. And I don't know if that's changed, but he said they, they uh, he's uh, where he's staying at, he said there's a shuttle service. He don't have to drive to the any of his appointments. They come by and pick him up. And, and so he, he's, he's, he's really excited. And he's, he's told me he had already bought uh, a lot of pictures. And, you know, his ministry, we got the pictures in the hallway. That's part of, that's his ministry. And he's already bought a whole bunch of pictures. And when I talked to him Sunday night, he was framing them. And he's going to start giving them away. And he's already telling people about Christ. And already had some good encounters with people. And uh, so uh, he, he's all excited. And he says when he gets home, Jeremiah and him going on tour. So we'll see. <laughs> uh, all right. Any any other prayer?
pray with Grace Mac. Yeah, I want to give a praise. I no longer have a G tube feeding tube. Yeah, they right. took it out today. Most of you already know. Praise the Lord. Good deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, she's tubeless. Tubeless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for eight months with that thing. I don't know. But y'all need to keep, keep praying because I can't eat just anything. Right. You know, I got to pick and choose. Yeah, but just the fact that you can eat anything is a gigantic step for your work. So. So. Right. It, it's coming back, same mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Good Slowly but surely, yeah. It's, it, but it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. They, I think I had to sign away my firstborn, and a girl started talking about, well, you know, you got this outstanding. I said, I already signed that they they going to take my first one if I don't pay it this month. You know, I said, but he's right over there. If you want him, go get him. And, he had him. and she looked over there. Oh. Just don't bother the dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Anyone else? Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, uh, Brother Jeremiah, would you lead us, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We ask that you reveal yourself during this Bible study and show us things that we've never seen before. In your name, amen. Amen. All right, will somebody read for me the verses uh, 22 through 27, please? We'll finish out chapter 20. I'll read it. Go for it. Starting at 22. Yes, ma'am. You shall therefore keep oh. all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them, that the land where I am bringing you to to dwell may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. <coughs> but I have said to you, you shall inherit their land and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean, and you shall not make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean and you shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. A man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Amen. So we've been studying uh, in this uh, chapter uh, and the chapter before this all the sins, the uh, Voluntary, involuntary, the sexual sins, uh, this, just all kinds of sins and all kinds of penalties that, uh, for, for committing these sins. And some of these sins are, are when you look at them, you think, man, you know, the, it, why is, is he going down this list of these, these horrible sins? And it, it almost gets kind of depressing when you read about it and all these things. Well, this, these last verses in this chapter explain why. He went into great detail with all these sins and all these things that that he did not want the children of Israel to do. And who can tell me what that reason is? It's abomination. It's going to cause them to be taken out of the land. Right. And, but he, he, he made the remark that this is what the people that you're replacing the people that I'm taking their land away from are committing these very abominations before him. Now, they weren't his chosen people. And so it doesn't make any difference whether you're saved or you're lost. When you commit sin against God, God sees these sins and there is a punishment. I don't care what status of life you're in, whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, there is a consequence for sin. Amen? And, and so it's to me it's a greater consequence because the Bible said to, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. So when we know that we're sinning against God and we know that we're doing wrong and we, we have access to the word, uh, it's something that, that, that God really focuses on. And there's no such thing as comfortable ignorance with God. There's no excuse uh, because 
The Bible says that at one time God winked at the ignorance of man, but he don't wink anymore because he it's no longer about animal sacrifices. His son has died now for these sins. He ain't winking anymore. It's all, that's all over with. And so uh, he, he says, uh, I want to, he said, if you, if you do these things, look at verse 22. If you keep my statutes, you keep my judgments, and do them, that the land whether I bring you to dwell therein, spew you not out. So what's happening to the Canaan, the, the Canaanites, and the land where they're going, the Lord is spewing them out of the land for committing these very trespasses that he warned Israel, don't do. Okay? These people are already doing uh, these things, and so uh, he and he he he, uh, he tells them. He said, uh, "If you look in verse 23, you shall not walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before before you." Now look at this, for they committed all of these things. And so they they're already guilty of the things he's telling them not to do. And not only is he telling them not to do them, he's telling them of, of the punishment that's going to come along when they do these particular sins. So he's adding the punishment. He's adding, he's showing them the sin. He's showing them the punishment. And uh, some of them are, are, are uh, worthy of death, and some of them are not. And so he, he wanted them to know, but he wants us all to know that he still abhors sin. And he says in that same verse 23, for they co committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. Amen? Now, We've got it in our head that God looks over our sin. Does he? <laughs> Does God look over our sin? And he, you better have not ever think that. <clears throat> he still abhors sin. He loves the sinner, but he, he hates the sin. And that's why he expects us to love people, even though we don't like their sin, he still expects it because he does the same thing for us. And so uh, he and he and, and so he, he tells them in verse 24 in the last uh, uh, line of it. He said, "I'm the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people." So he says, "Okay, you're separated. I have called you out. I have chosen you, and I expect you to act different from anyone else." Is that still an application today? You better believe it. And the problem with Christianity today and the problem that we have in our loss of witness to people and people don't want to hear us is because we have become just like the world. And he says that that's not the way it is. He said, I have separated you from other people. And he has separated us by salvation in his son. We're not supposed to act the same way we used to act. And you know, that's a hard pill for us to swallow. And we have to be careful because we do know that sin's not going to enter into heaven. When you go into heaven, you're not taking any of that sin in there with you. And those who are saved that are covered in the blood of Christ, you know, a lot of people say, well, what if you get killed? And we can ask some of the silliest questions sometimes. The, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us. He's redeemed us. He's... he's uh, He's ransomed us. He's done. He's paid the price for us. And, and you know, when we willfully sin, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when we're going to kick the bucket, but he does. And he looks at us, and and, uh, and, and, and there has got to be a way that, that you know, we're not going to die sinless. Amen? But there are people that tell you if you die with sin in your life, you're going to go to hell. You can't be saved. That's not true. We need to confess our sin. We need to, to apologize to God for our sin. We need to ask Him for forgiveness. But there's people who have died that didn't get that opportunity before they died. Amen? That's right. And so... Brother, I, excuse me if I'm interrupting, but it's just like uh, people asking why God allowed children to be killed and why good people have bad things and all that kind of stuff. I can say the one thing you need to keep in mind is it's in the hand of a just God yeah. and that there's no mistakes going to be made. That's right. So you just trust the Lord for whatever reason, whatever happens to anybody, 
a just God is going to make a ruling and a judgment on that. That's right. And you can fool a man, but you're not going to fool God. You, you cannot fool God because he don't, hear, he don't even have to listen to you to know what's going on with you. That used to bother me a lot trying to figure out why God allowed it, but it, it's in the hands of a just God, and it's not for me to second guess. Uh -huh. what's going on in this world. And that very issue is something that his disciples even asked him, uh, Jesus Christ, they asked him, why, why do the wicked gain, have gain, and good people perish, and all that? And, and you know, the Lord don't have a, uh, didn't give them an answer for that particularly. He just, he, we, have, we live a thing called life. And in our life, you've got people that do well, I mean, prosper, they, they, they gain, you've got good people, you've got wicked people, you've got evil people, you've got Christian people who don't act as good as other Christian people. You just got all kinds of people in life happens and God understands that, but he died for every one of us anyway. And so we, we, it's, we God, thank God that we're not gonna be their judge. Well, he don't do it to, he don't do it to you every time. He no. may, you may do something other than he, he may punish one of you, somebody in your family, you know, that that you gonna suffer over or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, when that that happens, you know, like what AJ was saying, you, why would God let this happen to us? <coughs> well, some of us have been faced with that because yeah. I was angry. Mm -hmm. You know, I I cursed God. That's right. He took my baby, and I didn't understand it. I quit going to church. I, I was mad, mm -hmm. but God understands that. You know, I, I, as time went on, I understood that more. Well, that's right. And, and you know, when I talk to people and try to comfort people who have these issues, and we've had it in our family, you, you tell them that God has these babies. He has these children. You will see them. They will call you mama. They're going to call you mama when you see them. He's got them. And so uh, they, you know, we were deprived from from a, a relationship with the child, maybe, but God will give us an eternal relationship with that same child. We're not going to miss. We miss it here, but we're not going to miss it there. It's going to happen there. And so it's it's something that we have to understand about God that uh, that everybody that that dies, you know, we can listen to me. How many of you have ever prayed and prayed and prayed to the Lord to spare somebody's life, to heal someone, and they die? Have you ever done that? Every one of us that have experienced death in our families, our parents have done that. Lord, please, and they died. Because, see, there are just some things in life we can't turn around. But there's a, I just got through reading a book about just that just, uh, instances like that but what we don't know we're praying for them to be healed and then they die but and guess they are. what they are healed right. but they're just healed in heaven yeah so, Amy's going through the same thing that she just said today her son was found four years ago today outside <coughs> his house and they, they said it was suicide yeah it didn't look like suicide but they ruled it suicide and she's mm -hmm. she was they was raised in church she went to uh Christian school, but she, I don't know what she, she's blind, but she just, like today, uh, for the last week, she won't come out of the house. Yeah. She don't talk, she don't. Yeah, it's a healing process, and, it, and, and it's something that, you know, and that's why our relationship with our Lord is so, so very important. And just like, you know, a husband and a wife, and you know, if they're gonna stay married, there's going to be times when they're going to get mad at each other and they're going to be mad for a week or two or maybe even longer and if you ain't careful, it, it, you'll think you're over it and it'll come right back and it'll all start over again. And if you're going to stay married, you've got to, you've got to deal with those situations. And so we're married to Christ. We have a relationship with Christ when we, we want to question the Lord. Lord, we know you can do anything. We know you can heal someone. We know you can uh, cause a baby to be born and help a baby survive. Why? And we have to be very careful in that relationship because the Lord has already, the Lord has already proved our love, uh, his love for us. Amen? He's proven that. And, and we don't have the right to challenge his love, but yet he allows us to, to, 
to be able to do that because he loves us and he and there's a reason we said a while ago the lord sees inside of us he sees that hurt let me tell you what the lord knows about he knows what that hurt feels like he watched his own son die on the cross the bible said that he turned the sky black and a lot of people say he couldn't look at it because unjustly his son died he understands how that feels. He knows how that feels. He's experienced that, that very thing. And so we, we have to be careful, but he allows us time for mourning. Hey, I think when the Bible talks about mourning, this is a process that he allows us to go through. And sometimes we blame God for, for things. That, but before it's over with, we thank God you came to a realization God, I can trust God, and I'm going to get to see my baby again. And she is healed. And she is completely healed, 100%. And, and so a lot of times, I heard a preacher one time say, why in the world do we, do, we, do we want the Lord to keep somebody in this life and, and where they're going to get sick again and they're going to die again? Why, why would we take the privilege of them walking into the party gates and walking into to the kingdom of God. Why would we do that? And boy, I thought I chewed on that one a long time. And we've all done it. We've, we've done that when they're laying there saying, Lord, take it. <laughs> we, 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 we pray, no, we don't want them to go. And it's selfish on our part to want to keep them. But it's something that God understands. It's something God understands. It, it, when Christ died, his mother experienced it, his, his uh, uh, apostles experienced it. Mary Magdalene experienced it. All those people that were with him experienced this very thing and wondered why. But thank God that three days later, he rose again. And that is the beauty. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us to comfort one another with these words. Because those who are dead in Christ, they're not dead, they sleep. And there's going to be a great getting up morning. And we, have to, we can comfort one another with that. We're going to see them again. And we don't know who they are. Amen. And so we, that's where we have to go with this. But, but he, the Lord in these scriptures right here are teaching the, these, uh, these people that he has separated them from all other people. But yet at the same time, he's very strict on the children of Israel. When they commit a sin, they can die for it. And he, he, he had that done more than one time. Remember Achan? When they went into Jericho and the walls fell and he told them, he said, I want you to go in there. I want you to destroy everything. The only one that was uh, not killed in that battle was Rahab. Was Rahab the harlot because she had helped the spies. And he told them, he said, don't, he said, don't you take anything. You just let it all lay there. Well, uh, uh, Achan uh, took a piece of cloth and some, some gold some precious uh, uh, jewelry or something, and hid it in his tent. And, and uh, boy, the next battle, they lost it against a, a far inferior force. They lost it, and Moses, whoa, Lord, what's going on here? The Lord said, they sin in your camp. And when they, when they found that out, they went to looking, and the Lord helped them find Achan, and when they found him, they, he, he confessed to it. You say, well, you know, when I read that story, I thought, well, he confessed. Why didn't they have mercy on him? They didn't have mercy on him. When he confessed, the Moses asked the Lord what they should do. And you know what they did? They dug a hole, or they found a, a, a pit. They put him, his family, his servants, all of his possession, his cattle, his horses, it, they put everything, and they stoned every one of them to death, and they heaped stones up over that. Is what they did. God was serious about them being able to obey Him, and was showing them the consequences of sin in their lives. And and you know what? I thank God we live in the New Testament, don't you? <laughs> I thank God we live in the New Testament. A lot of us wouldn't make it. <laughs> Yeah, but but what happened? And you know, a lot of people don't agree that God changed. He did change. He did. He don't change, but He changed the way things were. He changed from the Old Testament way to the New Testament way. He did that. Jesus fulfilled these things, and we don't stone one another anymore. Christ didn't want the lady stoned that they threw at His feet. 
But he didn't pardon her sin, did he? You remember what he told her? Go and sin no more. And if he wasn't asking her, he was commanding her. Don't do this again. You're fortunate this time. And he didn't say all these things. I said for him. He was, you're fortunate that you survived this. And listen to me. If it hadn't been for Jesus, she wouldn't have survived it. They had killed her. And, and, but, but they had done taken the, the punishments and they had added man's version of it. And they were willing to stone the woman, but not the man. Amen. And so a lot of things had changed. Anyway, we've got to get back to this right here. And he said, now listen, in verse 25, he said, you will make a difference between clean and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean. You shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated you from as unclean. Now, did that change? In the New Testament, did that change with Christ's appearing? <laughs> with Jesus, I just got through reading this this week when they began to, to question Jesus about his disciples eating without washing their hands. And you remember what uh, Brother Sam, what he told those people? He said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's things that come out of the man that defile him. And boy, now he puts a damper on the Jewish customs in, of that day. Because they were really strict on those kind of things. And as a uh, matter of fact, they were so strict on some of those kind of things, and yet they were so slack on other things. He made another statement. He told them, he said, he said you'll swallow a, a camel and choke on the gnat. And you know, if we ain't careful, we'll be like that in the church. Amen? Anyway, well, I want, uh, when I read this verse 25, you know, uh, a scripture came to my mind. It's the reason I asked you, does he, did he change this? Well, he, he may not have changed it as far as people, uh, as animals go, but he changed it as far as people go. You remember when uh, he got ready for uh, the, the Gentiles to receive the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 10? And Peter was up on the rooftop and he was he was having a vision. Y'all remember what that vision was? The sheet let down. There was a sheet that turned down. What was in that sheet? Sheet. Clean and unclean. There was there was all manner of unclean and clean beasts. And what the Lord tell him to do? Peter, take and eat. That's what he said. And what did Peter tell him? No, Lord. I'm not supposed to eat anything unclean. What he told him. In Acts chapter 10, read it for yourself. He did that three times. Every time Peter gave him the same answer because he, he knew this scripture right here. No, Lord, I'm not going to do that. And he thought maybe, the, I don't know what Peter was thinking, but I know what I've been thinking. The Lord's testing me and I'm going to pass this test. And the Lord wasn't testing him. The Lord was trying to show him something that he was fixing to ask him to do that Peter thought was unclean. You know what it was? He was going to ask him to go to them funky, nasty Gentiles and lead them to Christ. And he wanted, he, and so his final words to Peter, he said, don't you call those things that I have cleansed common and unclean. That's what the Lord told him. And the door, they knocked on the door. And he went to uh, Caesarea and Cornelius got saved the Gentile people. And that's when Peter came up with the great conclusion that God is not a respecter of persons. Amen? And so this is, so he, he uh, but he, in this scripture right here, God was serious about this command. And, the, and they were, they would be worthy of separation. They could be cast out of the camp. They could even be killed for, for uh, disobeying these, this command right here. But yet in the Old Testament, he, Peter didn't eat nothing dirty, but he got chastised for saying he wouldn't. Amen? And so he says in verse 26, he said, By doing these acts of obedience, you shall be holy unto me, while the Lord am holy. And I have, now he says it again, while he said, I separated you. Here he says, 
I have severed you from other people that you should be mine. That God expects Christian people to obey Him. God expects us to know His commandments. God expects us to know His Word. And I'm going to tell you, when we stand before the Lord and He says, why didn't you ever read my Word? And we, well, I didn't have time. You think that's going to hold water with Him? Huh? And don't you dare say I didn't understand it. And that's why we're here even tonight. And so he said, I have severed you from other people that you should be mine. We are a severed people from this world. The, the Apostle Paul says, our citizenship is not even here anymore. Well, we make a big deal out of citizenship, especially in the, in the, uh, in the time we live in where so many people are or, uh, or we call them illegals and aliens and all this stuff and we make a big deal about them voting and they're non-citizens or getting getting rights and they're non-citizens. Well, <laughs> you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time worrying about that and Paul's trying to tell us we're not even citizens of this place either. We got a new citizenship and it's in the kingdom of God. It's in God's land. It's in heaven. That's where our citizenship is. And he wants us to be more worried about that place than this place. Does that make sense to y'all? <laughs> but you know what? We'll spend 25 hours a week watching news about what's going on in this place. And being angry and upset and hurt and furious over it. And the Lord's telling us, you better worry about laying up some treasure over there. You need to worry about seeing people come to know me here because that's our, that's our calling. That don't mean you're just supposed to lay down and act like nothing wrong is going on. We're supposed to confront evil and we're supposed to confront things, but we're supposed to do it as a Christian. And, and the best way to do it is to live our lives the way we expect everybody else to live theirs. <coughs> Boy, wouldn't that be a change? <coughs> And Christ taught us that. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If, if you were caught in a sin, how would you want someone to treat you? I didn't say, how do you expect them to treat you? I said, what would you want them to do for you? Would you want mercy? <laughs> would you? Would you want to be forgiven? Of course. Sure we would. And so that, that's what Jesus was telling us. If you treat other people like, you know, the best thing we can do sometimes instead of gossiping about somebody is put ourselves in their shoes for a little bit and understand them more about what they're going to. It don't justify what when they do wrong. It helps us to be merciful to them. You remember what Jesus told the, 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 the Pharisees? He said, you've gotten away from the weightier matters of the Lord. And that's judgment, mercy, and righteousness. You got away from that. And everybody that you found doing something wrong, buddy, you just throw stones at them and it's all over with. You cut it out. And the Lord came to give us mercy. That's why the Bible said in the, in, in the Old Testament, not New Testament, the Bible, you know what the Bible says about God's mercy in the Old Testament? It endures forever. It's from everlasting to everlasting. That's God's mercy. If God wasn't merciful to us right now, where would we be? <laughs> okay, let's move on. And so he says, and he goes ahead and he says, I have severed you. And he says, uh, uh, and then he tells us again about the familiar spirits and wizards and all these things. And, and he wants those people out of everything. He don't want the children of Israel to fall into that same thing. They shall be, you shall stone them with stones uh, and their blood shall not be on you, shall be upon them. Okay, any questions about this? I know we spent a lot of time. We spent a lot of uh, three, three services are uh, now just about three services on this one chapter, and it's a small chapter. Okay, we're going to be talking about the laws now regarding the priests. Now, there's some 
denominations, if you will, that still have priests. I'm not a priest. I'm a pastor. Is there a difference? <laughs> well, the priests of this day performed the rituals. Well, I do that too. I do baptism. I do uh, Lord's Supper. Those are about the uh, rituals. I do weddings and things like that. I do funerals. Those are ritualistic in our day. Uh, but uh, we're not a priest in the sense that Aaron was a priest. Amen? If, if we have something called a high priest, we don't have what they call high pastors. Amen? Or high preachers. Now there's preachers that have have got more authority in an association or something like that. You know why they have more authority? Anybody know? I do. Because they've got the bigger congregations and they've got the most money to, to that they deal with. And so they get special places and is that Christian? Is that is that scriptural? <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be. Because most of the time what you found in the Old Testament when the prophets had the truth of the Word of God, they didn't get to special places. They got a fish hook at them all the time because they confronted that very thing that we still do today. They confronted it. Amen? You know what? We, you know how? That's the reason we don't have a numbers board out here in this church anywhere. It, it ain't because maybe y'all don't want one. Y'all might want to keep up with numbers. You know what I think about them numbers? They don't mean doobly squat. Except for the association to keep up with the progress of how many people you've got and how much offering you take up. <laughs> Amen? They don't need that information. Because our job is not to, to just Fill the pews with people. You know what? Do y'all think I could fill this house up? I think I could. You know how I could do it? Now some of y'all may leave, but there'd be ten more to take your place. Tickling All I gotta do is start tickling them. Y'all are okay. Y'all are doing good. Oh yeah, living in the dark thing, big deal. Homosexuals, <laughs> come on in. And then I could go to the book of Revelation and I could tell them about the coming of the Lord, the burning of the world, but y'all are okay because you're here with me. You can feel, I promise you'd fill this place up with building up building. Y'all wouldn't because you wouldn't be here. God wouldn't be here. No, and he wouldn't be here. But people will believe a lie a lot faster than they'll believe the truth sometimes. And the lie will never set them free. Never will. Only the truth can do that. The Son is the only one, Jesus Christ, who can set a person free from this world. And when you preach that, and then when you start preaching that, and you start telling people you've got to live a certain way, that's what he's telling these people. You've got to live this way, you're in trouble. And when you start preaching, you got to live with people who don't hear that. They'd rather hear that they're okay, that everything's good. That they're doing perfect. That's another one of the signs of the end of time, too. Well, I think I don't know about this all through the scripture that that goes on. But, yeah, but it says in the Bible too that uh, there'll be a lot more and more false prophets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which prophet was it that uh, I don't remember his name? It wasn't one of that wrote the, the the Bible. I can't remember his name. Uh, but uh, they, uh, Jehoshaphat asked this uh, Ahab, uh, he said, do you have a, a prophet that don't tell you what you want to hear? They were trying to get ready to go to battle and, and uh, Ahab was the, the king of uh, Israel and Jehoshaphat was king of Judah and said, don't you have a prophet that don't, because he had called all the prophets together and asked them and inquired them, was it okay to go to war? And uh, all them prophets say, oh, yes, old oh, king, just do what you want to do. You take the men out there, the Lord got it all done. It's, they're going to beat you. Y'all going to win this battle. It's going to be something. 
And Jehoshaphat got smelling a rat because all of them was in agreement and he didn't know about that. So he said, don't you have one prophet? And he said, well, there's one prophet out here, but we don't never invite him here because he never tells us what we want to hear. <laughs> now think about how silly that sounds. And you know what? Jehoshaphat said, I want, I want to hear it. And boy, when that prophet got there, he said, yeah, you're going out there. He told Ahab, he said, you ain't going to live through this. You're going to die. Boy, they, they beat him up. They slapped him and kicked him out. And they went to battle. And guess what happened to Ahab? He died that day. And Jehoshaphat almost did because he didn't listen to him. And so we had to be careful when we, when we want people to tickle our ears because the Bible is given to us. It is an inspired word. It, it's supposed to give us inspiration, but it's not just for that. It's for, do you know it? It's for reproof, it's for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Now those three words right there means you need to know what it says and you, you need to change the way you live to, 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 to be doctrinally sound. That's what reproof, reproof ain't a, ain't a good word, that means I'm going to tell you you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Amen? And then it goes on to say it's not only about reproof, it's about correction. So not only do I tell you get from the Word, now I don't get to tell you this from my personal information, I tell you this from the Word, that what you're doing is wrong, and then it's for correction. And if you do this, it'll become right. So I have to tell you uh, reproof and correction that means you have to repent of your sin, call on the name of the Lord. He's faithful and just. It's simple. And then it says it's not only for doctrine, for reproof and correction, but it's for something else. What, does anybody know what it is? Instruction in righteousness. So it's also to tell us what we do later on, how we need to do things. That's what the Word of God says. And that's what preachers and teachers are supposed to preach and teach. Now, the preacher's foremost uh, sermons are to be about Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? Because that's the power of the gospel. And so we're supposed to preach that. And so even if I preach other things that before it's over with, I have to bring that to your attention so you'll know because that's what people come to. They need to know that. Anyway, let's look at the law regarding the priest. Somebody read for me verses uh, 1 through 5, please. I'll read them. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests and the sons of Aaron, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. But for his kin that is near unto him, that is, for his mother, and for his father, and for his son, and for his daughter, and for his brother, and for a sister a virgin and that is nigh unto him, which hath no husband, for her, for her may he be defiled. But he shall not defile himself of being a chief of man among his people to profane himself. They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. Okay, so he tells the priest uh, regarding the laws of the priest, he told Moses, he said, you go tell the priest uh, these things. And he said, there shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. Uh, and so he, he, but he did give them permission. He said, but except for his kin folks. Okay. He was allowed to, to, to be able to touch his, his dead mother or his, her, or his father or his son or his daughter uh, uh, and his brother and a sister, as long as she was a virgin and had, uh, had never been married, uh, with, which has no husband, uh, for, my, for them he could be defiled. The Lord would allow him, uh, because he, he understood the grief of a near kinsman, that he would allow them to touch them. And so uh, he, 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 he's telling these people this, why do you think he has this command to the priests? Because he expects his priests to be different from everybody else. Let me ask you a question. Do you expect your police officers to uphold the law? Yes. And if a police officer 
breaks the law is that worse than a common person that's not a police officer breaking the law? Yes. Just go ahead and nod your head yes. Because why? He's a representative. He's a representative and he arrests people and gives people uh, tickets for doing the very things that he would do. Now that's hypocrisy to, to, to the nth degree. Alright, do you expect the preacher to act different from everybody else? You, do, if, if I was to go out and get me a girlfriend, what would you think? Need it if I kill you. Well, as long as she's got her boyfriend, I have that authority. I have that right. Yeah. But you, you, you see what I'm saying? You don't expect me to, to go up in the crowd and start telling them filthy jokes and cussing and, 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 and drinking. Do you? No. Nope. That's what I thought. But if one of y'all did that, you would probably wouldn't like it. But you probably wouldn't run them out of the church. The preacher, you'd run them off, wouldn't you? You might not the first time, but you would sooner or later. I'd run you off. You'd run me off. <laughs> and so he's telling these men, I, I expect you to do things differently from everybody else, but I will make some allowances for you. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and uh, we got about just a few more minutes. Somebody go ahead and read me the next 12, uh, 6 through 12, please. They shall be holy unto their God and not profane the name of their God. For the offerings of the Lord make up fire and the bread of their God they do offer. Therefore they shall be holy. They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane, neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God. Thou shalt sanctify him, therefore, for he offered the bread of thy God, he shall be holy unto thee. For I am the Lord which sanctify you in holy. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt with fire. And he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil is poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garment, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. Neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. Okay, so it, it sounds like the Lord contradicting himself here now because he, he says that uh, the this priest he's talking about here now, he's talking about the high priest. They shall be holy unto their God and not... Now, what, what does the word profane mean? Now, we, we use the term profanity to, to, to identify what? Cussing. Cussing. Profanity. Is that all the meaning of that word? Okay. Yeah, it's got a lot of meanings. And when, so when we see this word profanity, and we're going to see this a whole lot in these verses right here about not profaning God not profaning the commandments, not profaning the tabernacle, not profaning it. And I, I wrote down the definition, I looked it up, it's characterized by irreverence for God. So anything that, that shows an irreverence that you have for God is profanity, okay? And so not only that, it says uh, uh, characterized by an, a, an irreverence for God or sacred things. Hmm not devoted to religious purposes, unholy, heathen, pagan, common, or vulgar. These are words that indicate profanity. Uh, the things that violate the sanctity of anything holy to God. Okay, that's why we have rules about uh, the sanctuary. We have rules about things and, and we have to be careful in enforcing these rules that we don't that we don't run someone off. Amen. Now it's one thing to enforce it uh, to to a member, uh, but we have to be really careful. And that's why the Lord told us, and if we're going to enforce laws and, and be judgmental that way, we better have our own act together. 
Okay? And so he, he, he's telling these things, but he, look at verse 7. He, now, some of this will help you understand why we have a standard that God has set forth and who can be the, a pastor or a preacher and who can be a deacon. I'm going to tell you right now, the, the, the belief that has been held for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, in the last 25 to 30 years has become under great scrutiny. Amen? That it don't make no difference how many times a man has been married he can still preach. Or how many times a man it don't it's it's not a it's not an insult from God to a man for doing these things. It's that the, the standard that God has set for those he calls to preach and for those he calls to be deacons. When when we we, we talk about the office of the bishop, the office of the deacon, and we read that a lot of people say, Well, I don't mean what y'all say it means. Well, right here, it says, Thou shalt not take a wife that is a, a whore or profane. So, so that's why when you read in the, in the book of Timothy about the office of the bishop or the deacon, it not only talks about the men, it talks about their wives. Uh-huh. This is where this comes from. All the way, all the way back before Israel ever had, Israel was ever a nation. And it says, uh, so... They should not take a woman who has been put away from her husband. Now, what does that mean? Divorce he is. A divorced woman. He, he can't have a divorced woman, is what it says. And now, uh, for he is holy unto God. Now, it makes an exception. It makes an exception for a woman who is widowed. Okay? That is widowed. It don't say that right there, but it, it'll say it later on. Thou shalt sanctify him therefore, for he offereth the bread. And he says, because he carries on the duties of the church and the tabernacle that I have given him specifically to do, he can't do it this way. He, 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 he got to be this type of man. Now, when I read this verse 7, there was an Old Testament prophet came to my mind. Y'all know who it would be? Hey, God. Hosea, what, when you read this and you look at this, who was Hosea married to? That is an interesting story. <laughs> he was married to Gomer. But wait a minute. Who told him to marry Gomer? God did. God told him to go get find a harlot and marry her. I think it says unfaithful woman, which is thank her. Well, she proved later on that she was very <laughs> unfaithful, all right. But, uh, but when you look at this scripture right here, of course, uh, Hosea was not a priest. He was a prophet. Now, whether there was a distinguishing difference in that or, or however you want to look at it, but a lot of times the prophets were catered to like priests. They were treated like priests and inquired of as a priest sometimes. And they also did uh, sacrifices. If you remember, Samuel did Isaiah, a lot of the prophets did these things, and so they 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 were they were priestly in their duties. But God told Hosea to go marry a harlot. Why would God do that? <laughs> he gave a reason. I know what my commentary says. <clears throat> he wanted him to uh, know what it was like to be married to Israel. That's, that's exactly Because they were so untrue and unfaithful. Unfaithful. He wanted Hosea to understand why God detested unfaithfulness the way he did. <laughs> and what was interesting is Hosea married Gomer and they went to having kids every year. Just boom, 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 boom. They had six or seven children. Just all right. And boy, after about the seventh one, she hooked them and found her another man. And, and she got so low that nobody wanted to have anything to do with her, so they would, they would get her and sell her. They would put her up on an auction block to be sold as a servant or a harlot. And poor old Hosea, he'd go get her, bring her back. And the, the Lord was trying to show us his great love for people, his, his, how it hurt him for us to be unfaithful but yet he still would honor his vow toward us and he would receive us back. And it happened to Hosea over and Gomer over and over and over. Now think about that. Aren't you glad we serve a God 
that's like that. And they're so merciful. His grace is, is so great. His love is without bounds. And although we, we make him mad and we hurt him, he still wants us back. Isn't that something? And that's what he says. So this is where they, they, all this stuff comes from. But there are exceptions in all of these things that God has made. And then he talks about the daughter, daughter of the priest now. Now I've got Melissa and Katrina, the daughter of a preacher. And it says, uh, he said, if she profaned herself by playing the whore, she profaned her father, she shall be burnt with fire. They're going to kill her. They're going to burn her. They're going to burn her. Well, they're going to kill her. Don't say to stone her. And then it says, and he that is the high priest, and that's the reason I knew we were talking about the high priest here, uh, among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated, he's been uh, set apart, and he's been anointed to do these things, to put on the garments. He shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes for this daughter. He's not even allowed to remember uh, when uh, Aaron's two sons uh, used uh, the wrong fire uh, to, to sacrifice and God sent a fire down from heaven and just incinerated them, burn them. And, and the word got out. And you remember what he told Moses to tell Aaron? He told Moses, he said, you tell Aaron, do not come out of that tent. All right, it ain't going to be good. And do not say a word. So he said, he said, the preacher, you don't even grieve for her. You don't mourn for her. You don't rend your clothes for her. Neither shall he go in to any dead body. So it's not just the, this, girl, this girl, if she does this, he can't do, go to any dead body nor defile himself or his father or his mother. And, and so this is the high priest now because why? His duty is to go to the holiest of holies. And so he had a special designation that nobody else in Israel had but him. And God wanted to hold him to this standard where he didn't touch anything, not even his mama, not even his daddy. You don't mourn for somebody that dies in their sin. You don't do any of these things. Neither shall you go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of God. For the crown of the anointing of oil of God is upon him. And he says, I am the Lord. Now, when Jesus gave us a parable of the good uh, uh, Samaritan, he gave us a parable about something just very similar to this. Now these people, the Bible don't tell us exactly who these people are. They're going to a place to worship. And this man has been beaten up by these bandits and left to die. And every one of them that came by him took a wide berth around. They wouldn't go close to him. They wouldn't touch him. Why? Because of these scriptures tell them that, that they... If, he had blood running out of him for one thing, so he was unclean. And then if he died, they had touched someone and died. And they couldn't participate in the ceremony that they were going to. But when the Samaritan come along and all that, and he just he bandaged the man up and took him and put him in a and an inn and paid for it and said he was going to come back later if he owed more money he'd pay all of it he, and, and remember what the Lord asked him he said who, who did right and every one of them said the same thing you know what they all said the Samaritan man is the one that did right they all knew to do right but they let tradition keep them from doing the right thing would they have died for touching something unclean no they just wouldn't have been able to participate in the service but this man could have died and they neglected him. Hmm. You know, we have to be careful that we don't become so holy that we're no earthly good at all. Amen? If you're on your way to church and you see somebody broke down and you say, I'm going to be late if I stop and help them, what are you going to do? Are you going to help somebody or are you going to Get to church on time. No, I say he's got a telephone in his pocket. He'll come. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good thing about it, brother, that's a lot of, that is true sometimes. You, it, but you still should stop and check. And, uh, you know, they probably say, oh, I've got to call somebody. Okay, well, I'm going on to church then. 
Yeah, yeah. It, it makes us all feel better to think it. Yeah, it does. It makes us all feel better. All right. Well, Brother Gary, would you call a, a preacher that tickles him, would he be a false prophet? A what now? A false, would a preacher that doesn't preach, that, like we said, tickle their ears, he's, he's not preaching directly from the Bible, would that be considered a false prophet? Hey, absolutely. A false preacher. A false preacher. The, the book I've been reading, which I mentioned a couple of times, that Billy Graham wrote, he says that, that there is, well, foretellers, a prophet was foretellers in the, in the uh, Old, Testament, Old Testament and during Jesus' time. There were foretellers. Well, they foretold all the way up to the end of time. So really, it's not any reason to have foretellers, but there's people that claim to be have visions of things that's going to happen. Well, what Billy Graham says is that a a, a prophet has to be 100% right 100% of the time. Yeah. And another thing said that if we have prophets today, that probably the closest thing to a prophet is a preacher who who uh, kind of leads. Lead, well, interprets the Bible would be considered the closest thing we have to prophets today. Yeah. So I would say that a uh, a preacher that's just preaching and not just trying to get people in there and not preaching like should, well, especially these people that's just in it for the money, I would say they are false prophets. Yeah, according to Billy Graham, anyway. Yeah, uh, does that make any sense? Yeah, and you know, Paul says when he's talking about the gifts that he said that God calls some to be pastors, he calls some to be prophets, and he calls some to be teachers. Now he mentions the actual word prophets, but in the writer of Hebrews in, in uh, chapter uh, one, the very first verse of, of Hebrews said, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So he tells us that he spoke in the past by the prophets, but he don't tell us he spoke since Christ came by the prophets. Uh, Jesus called John the Baptist a prophet. Was it Jesus a prophet? Jesus was called a prophet. He was he called was a priest. He was called a, a teacher. He, he, I don't think he was ever called a priest. He was called a master. He was called a teacher. Rabbi. A rabbi. Rabbi, which means teacher. He was called that. Uh, but he was never uh, called uh, the son of God by those who didn't believe in him. He and a preacher is a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we, there's, there's, different, there's different callings. There's different gifts. There's different ministries. And, and you know, when we look at the scripture, the scripture not only tells us that there's all these diversities of gifts and ministries, but it tells us that, uh, that there are differences in the administration of these gifts. So we have to be careful when we point out a, a group of people that's doing a certain way because that, that because of what, of what Paul said, that there's different ways to administer and use these gifts. And, and we don't need to be condemning or condescending toward people. Uh, you know, we don't, I had never heard anybody speak with tongues in this church. But the Bible tells us, do not forbid that. It gives us a, a method with it, but it says don't forbid it. So we have to be careful, uh, uh, not only the way we use our gifts, because I think our, uh, the gifts are abused and used in an unholy manner. That's what First Corinthians is all about. That's why Paul was addressing this church because they had taken these gifts and just ran with them and they were, it was all about the gifts instead of being about the Spirit and being about the Lord. And they were, they were just in, a, in almost a, a competition to see who could speak with tongues the most or who could do this the most. And Paul come in and man, he wrote a letter and tore them up over that stuff. And he said, no, no, that ain't the way this works. God's not a God of chaos, he's God of order. And so he told them the correct way to do it. He said, if you speak with tongues, don't do it, but three of you is it. And, if, and after the third one, you need to pray for an interpreter. If there's no interpreter, you know what Paul said, do? 
keep silence because it's about edification of the body. It's about coming together as the body to be edified. That means that you need to understand what's going on. You need to understand what I say. You need to understand what I teach. If I'm talking in an unknown tongue and there's no interpretation, ain't nobody knows what I'm saying. And Paul said, that's not the way this works. It goes in the wind. It just, it's just, you're just, and I'm going to tell you something else. When the Bible says quench not the spirit, it's not talking about people who don't speak with tongues. It's not talking about people who can't lay their hands on somebody and heal them. It's talking about substituting yourself in place of the Holy Spirit. It's talking about taking the focus off the Holy Spirit and putting it on you. And if we're not careful in church, we'll do that very thing. We'll take the focus off of God and everybody be looking at us. And some people like that attention. Y'all, we got to stop it. Y'all done got me preaching again. Let's stand. And I'm not belittling anybody's religion. I'm just telling you that what the Bible is teaching that. It's teaching us and the reason it teaches what it does. That we have to do these things according to the will and the plan and the order that God has us to do these things. And it's all for edification. It's so we can learn about who he is and understand the word of God. And anything we do in the church that stops that or prohibits that is not good. It's like you were talking about those people competing. Well, they, when, uh, say, if God gives someone the gift of uh, speaking in tongues and there's other people that, that are jealous about that, that jealousy is a sin. That's right. Right. Anyway, I love y'all. <laughs> well, Sam, would you just dismiss us? Oh, and don't forget Brother James had to leave. He's, he's, that old issue he had a couple of years ago where he was had this blockage at his back. And he's going, he's going to be going to uh, the VA tomorrow. And uh, last time they had to go in there and ran, run a, something up in there and bust all that out. And it's dangerously close to his pancreas. So we have to, you know, we never really need to be in prayer for him. Well, Sam, you just missed it. Father, once again, we do thank you for this Bible study that we've been able to privilege to hear your word preached and taught again. And Lord, you know, everyone that's on the prayer list, you know, Brother James had to leave all the over for being good, feeling good. Lord, we just ask you for mercy to on everyone. Ask you to be us and be with us and to head out separate ways. Forgive us of what we've failed you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.